And so on Christmas at this time, we hope that each one of you will be given thank you, a special consideration uh, to the problem of growth. That by the time we get around to next Christmas, there will be more stars in the terrestrial firmament. That more people will be bound together by the great truths of life. Otherwise, we will find a very strange chemistry occurring. We will find that the instruments for the manifestation of life will gradually deteriorate. The channels will no longer be clear. There will be various stoppages. There will be cholesterol in the psychological arteries of humanity. <laughs> we will get to the point where we cannot get the blood to the heart, where then we begin to watch the saddest thing of all. Not a sudden departure from here, but a gradual loss of those virtues and values which are most necessary to our personal well-being and to our collective existence. This coming year, you will help the sun in its northward journey uh, to be supported so that each day of the month, as it moves toward the winter solstice, each one of us will have a little more contribution to make. We will not be satisfied simply to take sun baths or take a vacation in a present climate. We will not be happy to allow the sun simply to shine on us while we do nothing. We will rather realize that our purpose is to have the sun shine not on us but through us, to all that is necessary, to all that is vital, to all that is valuable, to the common good. So to grow up each year with the sun is very important so that each year we become a little wiser a little happier and a little stronger and more inclined to offer thanks and our various offerings to the sovereign sun and then when we come finally to the summer solstice and it begins to fade again then we suddenly have another descriptive thought as the sun slowly fades into the winter it leaves us standing on our own feet. As it grows less day by day, we must supp supplement this loss through our own insights. If it is possible to recognize that in winter, people who are poverty-stricken need help in the form of clothing and food because the seasons are too inclement. In the same way, the soul, functioning in its own needs, requires a little more of our giving when the great sovereignty of the sun fades a little from us. It is as though we were growing into maturity, and little by little the parents who guided us fade away. And as they become less and less capable of guiding and guarding, then we must take over ourselves, take care of our own destinies, and guard and guide those who have loved us. Everything is a sharing and every year is an opportunity to grow enough to share a little more, to do something better about all these things, rather than to simply drift along from day to day in our old ways. It seems, therefore, that uh, somewhere along the way, we're going to have to get a new theology, in a sense, based upon the interpretation of the vast theology of existence itself. We have created all kinds of religions. Some are good, some are not quite so good. All are mostly sincere. There's no question about it. But there's something that they sort of set them apart. Theology was a branch of learning to be listed with medicine or art or literature or, or law. Theology was a separate thing to build a separate doctrine or a separate integrity to guide people through the years of life. There was nothing essentially wrong with it. The difficulty with it was it gradually crystallized. It gradually came into a state in which the acceptance of the theology was what helped. And this is not true. It is the living of it. It is the exploring of it. It is the divine examination of all these different values. And the real purpose of theology is to form a ladder up which man can step rung by rung until he can come face to face with reality itself. So in the course of time, 
this theological structure has lost its vitality. It has lost the realization that it was a science of salvation, not merely a series of beliefs. And that when two or more religions lock in some time, kind of horrible animosity, each one claiming to be more kindly than the other and committing every conceivable crime in the name of the God of love, if this thing, type of thing happens, gradually little people, ordinary folks, are going to begin to see through the situation. They're going to realize more and more that these great formal structures are crystallized into patterns. Some of these patterns are good. There's no reason why we shouldn't follow the faith of our fathers if we so inclined. But we should take that faith as a means of discovering the faith of our one father, the eternal light from which we come. We must keep faith with truth and life, not merely with an assortment of opinions and beliefs. We must take no shortcuts. We must not try to join something that will save us from our miseries without improving our natures. Everything must be done lawfully and properly. Man is rewarded for his works and not for his promises. He is rewarded for his deeds and not for his pretensions. Each person in his own way is a traveler toward the light. And that light cannot be taken from him. It cannot be obscured by any physical phenomena. It could not even be destroyed or obscured if the planet Earth itself dissolved, because this light is eternal. And that which becomes one with it gains eternity with it. That which comes to see it shares it. And little by little the individual who saw only his own backyard gradually begins to see his neighbor's life, and then his country's life, then the world life. Everything comes as the person gains through the experiences of the testing of beliefs with love and understanding. One of the problems that we have had is the importance of travel. People who have, get, have seen other faiths have a better understanding than those who have been locked always in their own. The more we experience or see or behold or appreciate the dedications, the convictions, the ideals of other people, other nations and other races, the more we suddenly come to realize that all these faiths are one faith separated only by geography and language. The real facts are always the same, and the facts are the oneness of life, the, how the parenthood of the divine, and the brotherhood of humanity. These are the great truths. These are the things that we should think about a little bit as we come to the Christmas season. For we are about to be given a new opportunity to grow. The gates of the temple will open again, and the processions of the initiates will enter in to experience more testing, more trials, more proofs of integrity. And as their proofs improve, as they show themselves to be more and more worthy, the secrets of the eternal will flow through them. The more we become uh, enlightened, enlightened and awake inwardly, the more we will understand of the universe, the more the great truths of life will shine through uh, to, to strengthen us and create in us a positive dedication. There are some interesting patterns and things that have come down to us from the ancients, including these various rituals, most of which tell us definitely that all ritualism is merely a symbol of life process. Rituals are things that life passes through in the process of becoming and later in the process of bestowing. These two great processes work together. The child born into the world, even in infancy, is passing through in, uh, initiations. The initiation of learning to walk. The initiation of learning to cry. The initiation of lay, depending upon the love of parent and bestowing from itself a strange trustfulness which has not been destroyed 
or sophistication or abuse. The child's perfect acceptance of life reminds us of primitive society that in the beginning did not have the type of mind that censored, divided, was suspicious. And because it was not suspicious, there were no suspicions. The whole thing developed within that child itself. Then came the second initiation into the mysteries, and that was growth. Here we find the child faced by the gradual dawning of its own vital resources. Here we find the child going to school, facing education, facing the various dangers and hazards of gradual acceptance into physical society. Here the child passes through so-called childhood diseases, and most people have them philosophically and religiously also. <laughs> Strange diseases of uncertainty, disappointment, disillusionment, discouragement, and antagonism of religious conflicts. These things the child has to learn while it is going to grammar school and taking long lessons in material it'll never use because it has no vital significance. But the child has to learn this. But then it goes into the next cycle and having not learned anything too important, it has not been given even the uh, enlightenment that we associate with the Montessori method of training children. Instead of having that child going into its teens with a little firm understanding of basic values, it enters into its emotional adolescence, which is the most dangerous period of its life, with practically no mature help. Here it has to learn. Here it has to pass through all kinds of experiences, some of them very trying, which can gradually become tragic, as we find with young people of today, who have to enter this period without any help, with very little understanding and very little preparation. The only thing they can gradually do is learn from experience. They have to go through things until finally, through experience, through constant repetition of error, they come to the realization of what is right and what is good. So they finally pass through this period of life, uh, hoping, struggling, trying uh, to make those adjustments which are necessary to the establishment of home and family. And then we come to the next period, and this is the period which the ancients associated with the sovereign son itself, career. Here the person has to build his way of life, prepare the problems of survival, you know, employment, profession, also all of the maturities of mind and emotions which are necessary to the maintenance of a proper civilization or a proper integrity of life. Here we find the child now grown up in what might be termed the golden age ruled by the sun itself. For here is strength, here is courage, here is the long period of career that extends between the end of education and retirement. This is the period in which the world must be faced. And in this facing, it is very important that the growing person shall begin to understand the mistakes that society itself has established. Has established. That we are all in a society that is not in harmony with universal truth, universal order, or divine love. We are in a strange kind of twilight which we have created for ourselves through the constant emphasis upon selfishness. Here we have the fortune hunter, the accumulator, the wealth and fame seeker, all of which, we may say, constitute a general failure as far as the initiation rites are concerned. No one can have enough money to buy entrance to the temple. He must do it, he must make this entrance, not by what he has, but by what he is. And if in so doing he has made the choice to depend upon accumulation for survival, he has made a mistake that will have to be paid for sometimes by many years of misfortune. All the way along, however, the planetary cycle is moving him through the degrees of 